This news program is proudly brought to you by Paradise Foods, celebrating 90 years in PNG. Supreme Court rules in favor of Prime Minister Morape. Security agreement to boost policing in PNG. And Department of Personal Management launches corporate plan. A very good evening. This is Wednesday's News. I'm Malcolm Waira. Thank you for joining us. The Supreme Court ruled today that the election of the Prime Minister, James Marape, last August on the floor of Parliament is constitutionally legal, with the five bench judges ruling in favour of Marape, the former Prime Minister and member of Yalibu Pangia, Peter O'Neill, in a statement highlighted that he, he is satisfied with the decision. The announcement of five bench judges' decision on the Peter O'Neill court case against the election of Prime Minister James Marape in last year's election saw the vote of four over one in favor of Marape's elections as Prime Minister. The Supreme Court ruled that the election of Prime Minister James Marape last August on the floor of Parliament is in order. The ruling also has a point of reference on the elections of more than 30 MPs whose legality was charged challenged in the same Supreme Court reference. Meanwhile, former Prime Minister and member for Yalibu Pangia, Peter O'Neill, stated that he respects the decision of the five-man Supreme Court bench that made the ruling. He, however, highlighted in a statement that there were breaches of the Constitution in the last election that they have ultimately ruled not to intervene in the parliamentary election of the Prime Minister. O'Neill stated, and I quote, of course I'm disappointed that the decision did not go our way and that the serious breaches of our constitution occurred. But I will respect the ruling of the Supreme Court made this morning in Waigani. He further added that many will find this very confusing that the court would rule in favor of Marape on matters that were unconstitutional. Sharon Engnui, National MTV News. Prime Minister James Marape has left the country today to Australia for a bilateral meeting with the Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. This meeting will see the signing of the Security Cooperation Agreement that is set to boost policing in the country, amongst others. My research also. Any questions? Prime Minister James Marape stated that the Security Cooperation Agreement will include stepping up the capacity in police and beef up support for the police sector. He said it will highlight that we have shared interest, borders and economic interest and the trading interest as well will be embraced in the stepped up Security Cooperation Agreement. The Prime Minister elaborated on the arrangements in the police sector. Uh, uh, the Police arrangements we have, they would be coming and working under uh, Royal PNG Constabulary. Uh, we're also looking at uh, expansion of our training facilities here uh, in PNG. That will also in, uh, include possibility of uh, becoming a regional police training uh, facility. We're stepping up in the areas of not just uh, general everyday duty police, but uh, police leadership. Uh, we're looking at uh, the uh, specific uh, specialized Police aspects like uh, in the training would include uh, investigations, corruptions, and the entire full gamut of police. We want to modernize our police ASAP. He further added that the agreement will spread out to embracing on law upkeep, especially on magisterial services and on judiciary with the aim of recruiting judges from Australia. On judiciary, as you know, Parliament uh, last week did allow for uh, an increased ceiling in our, our judges. We also want uh, uh, judges, if uh, to be recruited, uh, judges from outside. We want to infuse uh, judges from outside also into our country and Australia and PNG as the same common law as a fundamental basis. So the entire full, full uh, government of the law and justice sector space will be embraced in this one also. And as I said, it has turned out to be better for us in the sense the entire structure will be responsive to the PNG law and justice sector structure. 
With the Prime Minister's departure today to Australia, the Security Cooperation Agreement will be signed tomorrow with the Australian Prime Minister. Sharon Engnui, National MTV News. The Department of Personal Management launched its 2023 to 2027 corporate plan today at the APEC House. The purpose of the corporate plan is for implementing and achieving the department's five year plan. Department of Personal Management or DPM Secretary Taya Sansan said the five year corporate plan has been prepared in compliance with Public Service Management Act 1995 and the National Executive Council. She added that objective and responsibilities of the corporate plan collectively contributes to the DPM's role in managing and enhancing the performance of the public service, ensuring efficient service delivery in line with government policies and regulations. But the corporate plan provides that guidance uh, whereby the department is steered towards delivery of its mandated functions as set out under the Public Services Management Act and major government policy initiatives. The secretary stated that the corporate plan has been framed with focus on achieving long-term government agendas, especially on improving the public service machinery. James Guken, National MTV News. Meanwhile, during the event, the Minister for Public Service, Joe Sungi, took the liberty to note concerns on the public service. With the public service being what can be described as the backbone of the nation, issues affecting the public service can have a toll on the nation. This was expressed by the Minister for Public Service, Joe Sungi. Among others, he highlighted that police officers who have reached retirement age or are unfit for service should retire. The retirement age should not be 65 years for disciplinary forces. They must go now. What are they doing? So the retirement age secretary must be reduced actually for the disciplined forces. It should not be 65. 65 is only for the administrative people so they can sit comfortable there. And some you know, frontline public servants like teachers and, and, and uh, maybe health workers. But for The minister also noted that there is a lack of robust police presence, a service essential as health and education in rural areas. So we need to modernize and make sure that you know, these public servants are coming up. They are paid by the government. The taxpayers' money pays them. Seven hours, 21 minutes, Monday to Friday. Seven hours, 21 minutes every Friday. The calculated pay for every public servant. I keep on saying this, but are we giving it back? Are we, do we worth it? Is it value for money? Additionally, the minister took this time to urge all public servants across the country to take ownership of government properties and avoid misusing them. He also emphasized that every public servant should work the full 7 hours and 25 minutes per day for which they are being paid. James Guken, National MTV News. The Global Green Growth Institute, or Triple GI in PNG, hosted a graduation for its Pacific Greenpreneurs Training Program where 13 entrepreneur candidates graduated with a recognized Triple GI certificate and a 5,000 US dollars check for outstanding performances during the training. The graduation program was held today in Port Mosby. The Pacific Green Preneurs Training Program, funded by Qatar Fund for Development, is a program that sees entrepreneurs, both thriving and startups, take part to promote a green PNG and Pacific. The training involved business owners who wish to advocate for a healthy and balanced forest space in PNG and the Pacific, showing large female than male participation. This program is actually um, one of my favorite programs, uh, working here in Papua New Guinea, for many reasons. Uh, and one thing that it gives people opportunity um, to be able to chase their dreams, have access to finance, get uh, financial training, and be able to take their product ideas, uh, form business, and take it to the market and make money and, and, and uh, support their livelihood. 
These business owners undergoing the Pacific Green Preneurs training range from horticulture, agriculture, fashion, recycling, tailoring, go organic bioenergy and clean water businesses and potential startups. You know, graduates, um, congratulations, and we have to be thankful to GGI for being behind the scenes and working hard to create this platform so that you all can be able to learn. And what we learn here is startup does help you to build your business model, and that's the vision and purpose that you have to carry through and be bold in doing the business. Graduating entrepreneurs received an official Global Green Growth Institute recognized certificate and a 5,000 U.S. dollars check each for outstanding business ideas, pitching of these ideas, and potential thriving of these businesses in future outcomes. Francisca Anania, National MTV News. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us. You're watching National MTV News. As an anti-corruption agency, the Independent Commission Against Corruption has big plans come 2024, where its work towards a Papua New Guinea with low levels of corruption takes full swing. ICAC's inaugural commissioners both revealed this at a press conference held at Hilton Hotel today. The Independent Commission Against Corruption, or ICAC, is currently in a startup mode where its focus is on building organizational capacity and capability, recruiting reliable and outspoken staff, and building networks with key partners widely across the public sector in Papua New Guinea. Commissioner Andrew Forbes said this trust and confidence in the public sector is important to encourage positive behavioural change among all public officials and citizens. People must trust the public service to carry out their duties capably and competently without fear or favour. Trust and confidence are crucial to the proper delivery of government services. ICAC plans to start operations by the first quarter of 2024 with limited capacity to undertake investigations while also building prevention functions. ICAC has been functional for about five months since we were appointed as commissioners in July. In this short time, we've got a real sense from the people, all the people we've met in PNG, that they're fed up with the corruption and it is very much time for change and they want a mechanism to bring about that change. Another thing which we've been addressing and discussing over recent days that it's going to take many, many people to have the will to make that change and not just ICAC. ICAC intends to work alongside government departments and agencies as well as continue its roles, functions and awareness within Papua New Guinea. The prevention area, the ICAC has a number of powers or abilities and one of those is uh, to make recommendations to government departments so we can undertake research uh, pieces of work looking at particular uh, uh, instances of corruption. It may not necessarily be an investigation, it might just be an inquiry that our research team makes uh, and we can then make recommendations. It could be a, um, legislative change, it could be policy, it could be uh, practices and procedures that we're suggesting that government departments uh, or, or whoever might implement. So it's quite wide ranging um, what, we, what we might take on during the prevention phase or, or after investigations. Francisca Anania, National MTV News. Providing quality training services to its students has always been a paramount focus for the nationally owned MAPEX Training Institute. The 19th graduation ceremony today marks another milestone, milestone success for the institute and students who will begin new chapters in life after this graduation. Right inside, 
To bid farewell to its graduating students, the Institute Executive Director Marcus Palem Kara based his speech on self-discipline. He mentioned that in life, self-discipline is important and gives one the ability to continue complete a task or a journey despite the challenges involved. In addition, setting self-discipline principles helps to easily eliminate bad habits and influences from the outside that affects one's future and life. A total of 97 students graduated with certificates and diplomas in various business and plant operating courses. The business school graduated 20 students, while 77 graduated in the plant operating courses, with four female among all their main colleagues. Mr. Palem Kara went on to encourage the plant operating graduates to constantly handle their job and perform duties with care as their job is hands on. He highlighted that their job requires patience and it is important to get rid of negative behavior and apply the do's and don'ts learned during the duration of their studies. He made mention that the institute will do changes to some of its programs and introduce additional courses for students to further their studies as of next year. Gladys Skila, National MTV News. Access to other basic services and education after 48 years of independence still remains a challenge in most, in most parts of the country. However, these barriers do not hinder one's dream and vision to have access to a better education. Graduate Hurulu David is a living, living proof of this. Hurulu David is a young man from Hawi Lakayu village in Hela province in the Lake Copiago district who graduated with a certificate in excavator operator. Today at the Hideaway Hotel after completing 16 weeks of training at MAPEX Training Institute. David shared that his village is located in the remotest part of the Highlands region of PNG, where basic service delivery such as road and education is a major encounter. Hence, seeing this a daily struggle and challenge for his people, David made up his mind to travel to the city to further his studies with MAPEX Training Institute after completing high school in his home village. Oh, in my district where I came, there is no, there is no better service, especially road. We don't have a good condition of road. Uh, that really motivates us. The boys who are standing at the back of me, there are a few boys who are standing at the back of me, uh, Uro David and a team, uh, we decided to take this course. This soft-spoken David made mention that his area is one of the tribal fighting zones in the province and a lot of young men his age dropped out of school. However, there are few like him who have a big heart for their village and province and sacrifice their life for further and better education to become agents of change once they return to their province and village. David is one among his other three colleagues who will return back to promote and enable change to happen within their province, village and district. Gladys Skila, National MTV News. Now taking a look at the Nesfan market report, the Kina closed unchanged at 0.2685 US dollars in the interbank market. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying. 0.2610 US dollars, 0.3955 Australian dollars, 0.2342 Euro, 38.05 Japanese yen. Looking at the commodity prices, at New York closed, gold is trading higher, coffee closed higher, cocoa closed lower, copper closed lower, palm oil closed lower, crude oil is trading lower, copper closed unchanged. On the stock market, the Dow Jones closed lower, the S6200 is trading higher, the All Ordinaries is trading lower. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us. You're watching National MTV News. Moving to overseas news, Indonesian authorities say all missing hikers on a volcano that erupted in Indonesia are all presumed dead after it erupted.
Search crews were not optimistic at all about finding the missing hikers who were still unaccounted for. So it came as no surprise when they started to climb higher on Mount Merapi and started to find bodies. A tropical cyclone trekking slowly towards Queensland is expected to, to intensify to a Category 3 system. Tropical Cyclone Jasper, as it's been called, is forecast to develop into a Category 4 system by Friday, which is a severe tropical cyclone system. And it is quite a big concern for the Bureau of Meteorology who say that it has happened or has sort of occurred quite early on in the season, especially during an El Nino year. Now, currently, as it stands, the system sits at a Category 1 uh, de declaration and is moving towards Category 2 towards this morning and then finally Category... Category 3 by this afternoon so it is going to be a few few days but according to the cyclone tracking map that's on the Bureau's website it is still sitting at about 1500 kilometres northeast of Cairns off the Solomon Sea where it developed and is strengthening and according to the trajectory it is still moving in a southeasterly direction but quite slowly towards the Coral Sea and the impacts aren't expected to be felt here in Queensland along the coast until much later in early next week. Uh, just to give people a bit of an idea of what that impact might be. Uh, the last time this happened was back in 2021 with ex-tropical cyclone Seth when it was declared a Category 2 and it impacted the Queensland coast as well and brought about some slight flooding along the southeast as well as hazardous surf. And the Bureau says that, that could be very similar with strong gusts forecast, heavy rainfall as well as hazardous surf and increasing tides. The Bureau is saying early next week. So we've got four or five days of beautiful Queensland weather to, to, to do those things around your yard. We would expect, as a Queensland resident, you would do those things anyway. First of November is the beginning of the cyclone season. We, you know, you really need to do some of those preparations yourself. There's only 5,000 SES volunteers in the state. We can't be everywhere at once. Two decades after the Mount Stromlo Observatory in Canberra was destroyed by catastrophic bushfires, the new telescope has been unveiled on the site. The telescope will, will help communicate more information on everything on bushfires to Mars missions. I'm going to step off the land now. More than half a century after a tracking station just outside Canberra broadcast these grainy images of the first moon landing, the capital is set to play another starring role in space communications. We're going to be able to video the next astronauts uh, operating and living on the moon and be able to talk to them too as well as download what they say back to us. The telescope is part of the Australian National University's new quantum optical ground station at Mount Stromlo and uses lasers rather than the traditional radio waves to send and receive data from space. We're going to be able to do terabit per second communication with our industry partners uh, we're going to be able to do unhackable communications in the future. It's a project five years in the making and is partly funded through the Australian Space Agency's Moon to Mars program. That means as well as lunar landings, like NASA's crewed Artemis II, the infrastructure will help with Martian missions. The quantum laser communications team has basically been doing the setup for the telescope, so things like generating a pointing model to make sure that you can track satellites and things like that. Fittingly, two decades after the Stromlo Observatory was destroyed in the Canberra firestorm, the telescope will have applications closer to home, able to undertake the continental landscape surveillance required to accurately estimate bushfire fuel loads. Something like optical communications enables us to be able to download that kind of level of data um, and respond much more quickly than we're currently doing. A giant leap in Australia's fire management. The BBC has evidence that women in Israel were sexually assaulted and mutilated by Hamas during the attacks on October the 7th. The US President Joe Biden has condemned the actions and says Hamas, Hamas must release all female hostages. Out of the chaos and mass trauma of the Hamas attacks, new stories are starting to emerge of rape and sexual assault. 
including graphic testimony from an eyewitness interviewed by police. I realised they were raping her, one by one. Then she was passed to another man in uniform. She was still alive when she was being raped. The scale of sexual violence here isn't clear. Bodies were mutilated and survivors few. And police admit they're facing a lack of forensic evidence from the site. You can still hear the Israeli bombardment of Gaza and see vast clouds of black smoke hanging over the Gaza Strip. But in the days following the attack, this site was an active combat zone. It was a big enough challenge to collect the bodies, let alone early forensic evidence of sexual crimes. Allah, Allah, Videos shot by Hamas during the attacks, an early warning. A large blood stain on the trousers of one woman captive. Female bodies piled on trucks, naked or semi-clothed. You see the way that it's burnt. She has her head Body collectors describe piles of women's bodies, naked from the waist down, some photographed with their legs splayed. Those who witness sexual attacks have struggled with what they saw. I spoke with girls that are now, at least three girls, that are now hospitalized for a very hard psychiatric uh, situation because of the rapes they watched. They pretended to be dead and they watched it and they heard everything from the side. Some of them want to kill themselves, some, some can't deal with it. Crucial evidence has come from the makeshift identification unit at the Shura army base. Teams here describe clear signs of assault, including broken pelvises. But the scale of sexual abuse during these attacks may never be fully known. It's definitely multiple. It's hard to tell. I've also dealt with more than a few burnt bodies, and those I have no idea what they went through beforehand. Um, bodies that are missing the bottom half, I also don't know what they, if they were raped. Staff at Shura told me there were patterns in the violence visited on women's bodies, according to location. National MTV News continues after the break with Rukai Sports. Stay with us. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Tukai Sports. Prime Minister James Marape has commanded the PNG athletes who have participated in the 17th Pacific Games, which was hosted in Honiara in the Solomon Islands. Prime Minister yesterday has commanded the teams that have participated in the 2023 South Pacific Games in Solomon Highlands. Marape added that PNG's participation in the Games is crucial in terms of maintaining its partnership with the Pacific Island nations. Our participation in such regional events entrances our continued relationship with all Pacific Island nations. Uh, it is uh, of utmost importance that all levels, every Papua New Guinea remain a good ambassador to our own relationship within, close by, and uh, also up, uh, further up, outside of our region. Uh, the Pacific Island countries remain our closest uh, 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 nations. Our, uh, they are brothers and our sisters, one, one ocean, one Pacific, one people. Marabe acknowledged the efforts of all the sporting administration. However, he further called to look at the system of sports in the country to prepare the best to represent the country. And at the time for sports, whether it's a regional sport or individual sports, then we pick the best readily available to participate. And so I've asked for us to relook at the entire sporting system, how sports has been administered in our country, uh, our, our uh, placement of sporting portfolio in the higher education sector is not just coincidental, but it's deliberate, just like some of the cabinets that have uh, restructured. It is with the higher education sector to depict that sport can also be an outlet for our young Papua New Guineans. Marape revealed that it is with the higher education sector to depict that sports can be an outlet for the young Papua New Guineans and highlighted that it needs serious attention. Johnson is gone. Key coming back at him. Here's Kamu going to have a crack. Kamu going to have a big crack at Key. And we'll be taking a look into this seriously. Uh, again, not just to win medals, but as an outlet to channel all our young 
uh, talents who have great propensity and, uh, for sport. Uh, they're born with sport as a talent, and they will be funneled through our school system. So I want to give our students at the close of the 2010 uh, Pacific Games, Papua New Guinea will again go into a uh, relook at what has transpired, the sports administration, the sports systems, and in a great way we will participate the the, uh, the schools for sport and sport development. Putubu is out of formation, falls to the feet of party. Sharon Engnui, Trukai Sports. Chairman of PNG Games Council, Albert Veratau, today announced that the 8th PNG Games is set to take place in January next year, with 18 provinces already confirmed for participation. Chairman Veratau today announced that the 8th PNG Games will be staged in Port Moresby early next year from the 10th to the 20th of January. The Games will be hosted by the PNG Sports Foundation in partnership with the PNG Olympic Committee and 11 national sports federations, along with the National Capital District Commission and other stakeholders. Mr. Veritao elaborated on the importance of the event. This is a national game. This is where all the provinces come together and this is where all the family, friends, relatives, everybody comes together to be part of the, this carnival. It is a huge carnival. And it's not just sport, it's also culture. It's also coming together of families. Advising that about 6,000 plus athletes are expected to participate in the games and around 200,000 plus people are expected to visit the games venues. The chairman made mention that the games organizing committee has yet to secure sponsors. He calls on potential sponsors and state-owned enterprises to come forward to offer support to the National Games. He also added that the Council has yet to receive funds from the government for the Games. We have now received expressions of interest from uh, a number of uh, provinces. They are now bidding for the nine PNG Games. And obviously that normally goes through the uh, bidding process. The, the games, uh, PNG Games Council will sit down at this uh, at, at when the, they're all together at this uh, uh, in the event. Look at the uh, the, uh, the bids. Consider all the uh, criteria. Have a look at them, and then make an announcement as part of the closing ceremony. To date, 18 provinces with around 4,720 athletes have confirmed participation through accreditation online. Late entries are expected from the remaining four provinces, which are Anga, Medeng, East Sipik and East New Britain province. Natasha Voy, Chukai Sports. Meanwhile, the chairman for the PNG Games Council, Albert Veratau, also announced that provinces have already submitted expressions of interest to host the 9th PNG Games. So far, the provinces are Oro, East Sipik and Western Highlands. We have now received expressions of interest from uh, a number of uh, provinces. They are now bidding for the 9th PNG Games. And obviously, that normally goes through the uh, bidding process. The, the games, uh, PNG Games Council will sit down at this uh, at, at when the, they're all together at this uh, uh, in the event. Look at the uh, the, uh, the bids. Consider all the uh, criteria. Have a look at them, and then make an announcement as part of the closing ceremony. Chukai Sports continues after the break. Stay with us. Chukai Sports. You're watching Chukai Sports. Moving to overseas sports. In cricket, the Australian Prime Minister's Eleven will play against Pakistan starting today, the 6th to the 9th of this month, at Mauka Oval in Canberra. 
The Aussies are going to be led by Nathan McSweeney and will feature a number of test hopefuls in the side. Marcus Harris, Cameron Bancroft and Matt Renshaw will all be out to put their case forward to replace David Warner as the opener uh, once he retires after the third test this summer. Australia will play Pakistan in three test series before playing two tests against the West Indies. The Manchester City manager, Pep Guardiola, has declared his team to win the Premier League. The defending Premier League champions sit in third spot on the table, having drawn their last three matches against Chelsea, Liverpool and Tottenham. If you play in the level, to, so Liverpool and, and Tottenham, we are going to win it again. The people don't believe it already for three draws, but... Uh, we're going to do it again, knowing that it's not easy. The Matildas coach has made his decision to conduct an experiment to the team for Saturday's loss against Canada 5-0. Uh, the coach says uh, the team needs to use these friendly games to give younger players more international experience against a high-quality opponent. The Matildas are set to field a more recognisable starting lineup in today's game in Vancouver. That game does get underway at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Gustafsson says the two games against Canada provide an opportunity to work on different styles of play that will benefit the Matildas going into next year's Olympic Games. That ends Chukai Sports. The Money Plus weather report is next. Stay with us. Chukai Sports. Chukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. The weather forecast for the next 24 hours. For the southern region, Port Mosby City, mostly fine and partly cloudy. Daru, partly cloudy with brief showers and drizzles. Keroma, cloudy periods with few showers. Alotau and Popondeta, partly cloudy with a shower or two. Looking at the Momasi region, Lay City, partly cloudy with possible brief showers and drizzles. Medang and Wiwek, mostly fine and partly cloudy. Vanimo, Partly cloudy with possible few showers. Moving to the New Guinea Islands region, Lorengau, partly cloudy with possible shower too. Kaveng, cloudy with few showers. Kokopan Rabaul, partly cloudy with few showers. Kimbe, partly cloudy with few showers and drizzles. Buka, cloudy with rain showers and thunderstorms. Looking at the Highlands region, Mount Tagant City, rain showers and possible thunderstorms, easing into cloudy periods, then morning fog patches. Goroka and Kondiawa, partly cloudy with a chance of rain, showers and drizzles tonight, then morning fog patches. Mendi and Wabeg, partly cloudy with few evening showers, rain drizzles, then morning fog patches. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus, with you always. And that wraps up the news, sports and weather for Wednesday, the 6th of December, 2023. From all of us here, pleasant viewing. Good night. This news program was proudly brought to you by Paradise Foods, celebrating 90 years in PNG.